Hello, my name's Richard Felix, and I'm going to take you on a haunted tour of Merseyside. Some of the stories we're going to hear are of real entities, ghosts, spirits and souls, that are trapped on this earth for whatever reason they happen to choose. They wish to be released to wherever good souls should go. Other stories are going to be of what I believe are recordings to do with tragic, traumatic and premature death. Murders, suicides, battles and accidents. Their time hadn't come. And I believe the energy used by that body in resisting death can be so immense that the actual event can be recorded into the fabric of a building, possibly even the soil. What better place to start this tour than here in the centre of Liverpool at Penny Lane. For over 30 years I was a record dealer and sold thousands and thousands of Beatles records without ever realising that Penny Lane was haunted. But it is. So come with me up the road and let's explore the ghosts of Penny Lane. And the property in question is number 44, Penny Lane. It's now property line. And certainly since the 1930s, there have been a lot of poltergeist activity emanating from that shop. A family that lived there, moved in there, and within days of moving in, heard many, many footsteps walking up and down the landing. Not of their house, but next door. It went on day after day after day after day until they got so fed up with it that they called in the police. The property next door was empty and the police said there were no squatters, there was nobody in there. Eventually they brought in a priest to try and exorcise the ghost but unfortunately it was to no avail and the family moved out in desperation. Everything seemed to go quiet until 1945. Someone else moved into the property and it started up again but strangely enough the house next door had been bombed during the war and again there was nobody living in it. The police investigated, no one was there, no squatters and eventually the same thing happened, that family moved out. I've just been in and had a word with the chap at Property Line and he said everything seems to have gone quiet but he said it's also happening other places on the block and I've been into the glass shop up there and apparently they've told me that they've heard many things and upstairs in their flat on frequent occasions glasses break, furniture's physically moved around and although the gentleman didn't want to be filmed he said I will tell you one thing he says it's a woman I know it's a woman he says because although I've never seen her I can sense her This is the little churchyard of St Andrews at Bebbington. On many occasions in this churchyard, usually at night, grey monks have been seen wandering through the centre of the graveyard, hovering above the ground. They're always legless. When I say legless, I mean no legs, not not drunk. They've been seen by many people in the village and while I've been standing here doing this bit of filming the number of people that have actually walked along this little trackway through the centre of the graveyard must mean that for many hundreds of years there has been a trackway through here. Why these monks haunt the graveyard nobody knows but this business about being headless and legless has something to do with the fact that they're here. We haven't got any legless monks here but would you believe I've found four headless monks. I think it's to do with tragic traumatic death. Their time hadn't come and I believe that for some reason the energy used by the body in resisting death can be so immense that the event just before death can be recorded into the fabric of a building, the stones, the bricks, the mortar, possibly even the soil. And then for some reason, on a certain anniversary, or if the atmosphere is the same, that event is seen again. 
by certain gifted people. And I believe that the recording that was made is always shown in exactly the same position as when the recording was made. Which of course means that if it's, if it's headless, it's because the ceiling is lower and it cuts it off of the head. If it's legless, it means that the floor or the ground is actually higher than it was at the time of death. So in other words, the old original trackway running through this graveyard is probably about 18 inches lower than it is now. So their sandaled feet, which are never seen, are always firmly placed 18 inches lower below this graveyard. This is Poulton Road, just on the outskirts of Bebbington. Just up the road through the trees there is Poulton Hall. In the 1970s, a motorist driving back along this road from High Bebbington had just come out of the illuminated area. He noticed the figure of a girl standing by the side of the road. She was wearing a long, dark coat and she had long, flowing hair. It was dark. He decided it would be a good idea to stop, pick her up and give her a lift to take her to wherever she was waiting to go to. He pulled up, opened the passenger's door and the girl just vanished into thin air. This was not an isolated incident. Three weeks before, another motorist had noted exactly the same sort of thing in the same spot. He'd seen this girl standing at the side of the road, he slowed up and she just disappeared. Also a lady walking along this road from Clatterbridge Hospital saw a girl standing at the side of the road. She walked towards her and of course the lady was going to acknowledge her. And as she got towards her, the same thing happened. She just vaporised disappeared. No one really knows who this girl is, but it's believed that she could be a young novice from the hall up the road there. She was on her way to a nunnery to become a nun. She'd had a broken romance. She was in the fits of depression. She never reached the nunnery. No one knows what happened to her. Whether she was abducted, murdered or even committed suicide around this area. Nobody knows, but her ghost still wanders around this road to this day. This has got to be the pit. I'm at a place called Hoy Lake. It's the Bermuda Triangle of the northwest of Merseyside. I'm trying to make for a place called Hilbury Island where there's a whirlpool, a vortex that drags boats and dinghies under the ground, under the water I should say. And <laughs> here I am sinking fast into the sand because obviously the curse of Hilbury Island, the vortex, even when the tide goes out, it's still here. We're well and truly stuck. I don't know what we're going to do when the tide comes in. We may never be seen again. I've taken to Shanks's pony because I'm well and truly stuck in the sand. I just hope that the recovery people come before the tide comes in and the sea around here claims another victim. I'm walking towards Hilbury Island. There's three. Hilbury Island, Little Hilbury and the Eye. They belonged, as did West Kirby, to St Werberg's Abbey at Chester. And in 1149, a monk from Chester wrote of strange goings on here in the sea. Of a vortex, a huge whirlpool that had been reported by many people by fishermen around here. It was treated by the locals for many years as 
myths and legends of old England. But in 1972, a family of four on Hilbury Island, walking along the beach, gathering shells, and the little 10-year-old boy told his dad to look towards the sea. And there in the sea was a large whirlpool moving towards the shore. It was making a loud thundering noise, and the noise resembled that of water going down the plug hole of the bath. There was a small rubber dinghy in the water and there were two people in it. And the whirlpool was moving ever closer towards them. The dinghy was being drawn towards the whirlpool and the two people jumped into the sea and swam away. And it sucked in the dinghy and it disappeared. The two people obviously managed to reach the shore. The family were terrified and they walked away round the island, much farther away from it. And when everything seemed okay and was safe and it had all calmed down, the dad let the two children go for a paddle in the water. And lo and behold, the whirlpool appeared again. The little boy had got a pretend, a toy life jacket, which was literally sucked off him and pulled towards the whirlpool. The father jumped into the water and dragged the two children out. And they beat a hasty retreat back home, as you can well imagine. At least 15 people since that event have reported similar, seeing this whirlpool moving around in the sea off the coast of Hilbury Island. Whether this is really a Bermuda Triangle of Merseyside, nobody knows, but there's certainly no accounting for our vehicle being stuck in the sand here, because to be quite honest with you, the areas we've driven over, you could build a house on it. So perhaps it isn't all myths and legends. Perhaps there's a lot more truth in it than any of us realise. We'll find that out when we see whether we get our vehicle out or not or whether it sinks to the bottom of the ocean. We've had to get the boys from Recovery Northwest out to try and get us out, but uh, I'm not so sure. I uh, have a horrible feeling that we're gonna be trapped in the Bermuda Triangle of the Northwest. It's not doing a lot, it really isn't. I think the curse of the island is going to engulf us. And this, this is our last hope. The local lifeboat tractor from Hoylake has actually come out to try and tow us out. And yeah, well, this is it, we're actually out. We are saved, I think. Looks like it. They were actually telling me how dangerous it is here. Whether it's got anything to do with the whirlpool, nobody knows, but the lad driving the vehicle uh, told us that he actually walked on here when he was a kid and sank right down to his armpits in the quicksand. As we drove on here, we made a joke about quicksand, but I'll tell you something. We won't be doing this again. Here we have a rather chilling ghost story. I'm at Bidston on the Wirral, lovely little village full of very old houses. Some Victorian, some Edwardian, some even older. Two sisters. Victoria and Margaret Webster inherited money from their mother and father after they died and they moved to live here in this idyllic little village in a terraced Victorian house. Victoria was 24, Margaret was only 19. They were good looking girls and they soon started to attract quite a few male suitors 
Margaret, the youngest, stayed home more than her sister Victoria. Victoria got a boyfriend called William. They went out frequently to local dancers. One night they went out and Margaret went to bed early. About 12 o'clock she heard a noise downstairs and presumed that it was Victoria and William coming home. She got up and went to the landing and looked down and shouted, is that you Victoria? There was no answer. She then noticed a shadow go across the hallway. She thought it was William playing tricks because they often um, joked amongst themselves. So she went downstairs expecting William to jump out, to make a jump. There was nobody there. She noticed that the embers of the fire in the living room were still burning and she noticed that they hadn't put the fire guard round it. So she walked across the hall to go into the living room to put the fire guard around the fire. And it was then that a figure appeared in front of her. A man with a horrible face, with a scowl on his face. He was wearing a white wig that looked like that that judges wore. He was wearing a red velvet 17th century coat with a silver waistcoat and he wore breeches with white socks. He smirked at her and came towards her and she retreated into the living room. There was a big round table in the living room and he started to pursue her round and round the table in the living room. She was terrified. She lost her voice, she couldn't scream. Eventually he caught hold of her and dragged her to the floor and started to ravish her. He ripped open her dress, he started kissing her and she eventually reached out and managed to get hold of the poker that was by the fire. She hit him repeatedly on the head. He yelled, jumped up and ran out of the living room into the hall and opened the cellar door and ran down into the cellar. Her screams attracted the neighbours and also William and Victoria who were returning home. They came in, she was covered in scratches, there was blood on her face and she'd got love bites on her neck. She told them about the man. They didn't really believe her. They thought that perhaps that she'd brought one of the local lads in and they ribbed her about it for weeks until eventually one, one day when Victoria and William were coming home from church through the parlour window they saw the same man staring at them through the window. They rushed inside to the house just in time to see him beat a hasty retreat down the cellar steps and he vanished into the cellar. It concerned them all very much but it seemed to die down and then in 1922 the water pipes burst, the water board came in and started to dig in the cellar of their house. They unearthed an old red mahogany coffin. The coffin was brought out from the ground because obviously it wasn't buried in inconsecrated ground. They opened the lid and found the decaying remains of a man wearing what was left of a red velvet coat and a white wig. He was buried with an old book which crumbled when they looked at it, when they touched it, because the air came to it and of course it started to uh, just disintegrate. But they noticed on the front of the cover that there was an upturned pentangle, the sign of a Satanist, and they could read the cover and it said Lucifer's Bible. Local historians went into the subject and found out that this man that had been buried in the cellar was no less than the notorious Richard Tilly, a famous Satanist who was a local rake, murderer and rapist from around this area. He was tried and sentenced for murder and rape and many other offences. But he escaped from jail and disappeared. 
people believe that he must have come here, to Bidston. And when he died, he was buried in the cellar of the house here at Bidston. Of course, the two sisters left the village and went to live in North Wales. Tilly's body was not buried here in the churchyard, but is said to be buried somewhere in the area of Bidston Hill. But they still say to this day that people walking late at night around the area of Bidston Hill can still see the ghost of Richard Tilly. Merseyside, like so many other parts of the north of England, is plagued by stories, by reports of large black phantom dogs. They have various names, Barguest, Padfoot, Gitrash or Gytrash, and here there's a famous story on the sand dunes at Formby. This dog is known as Trash. It's a large, black, Labrador-type dog, nearly the size of a calf. It has huge, saucer-shaped eyes, glowing red. And many people on the sand dunes here at Formby have reported seeing this dog, this hellhound. In the 1950s, a drunken gentleman returning from a pub was taking a shortcut through these sand dunes when he was confronted by this huge dog, Trash, its eyes glowing as it stood staring at him and growling. He took a swipe at it with his stick and the stick went straight through the phantom and the drunk threw down his stick and ran. It soon sobered him up, especially when he arrived home to find that his father was dead. These phantom dogs are bringers of ill omen, harbingers of death. There are not that many haunted castles in England that you can actually stay in. But here at Liso Castle, which is near Birkenhead, it's now been converted into a hotel. So you can actually book in and stay in a haunted bedroom. This incredible place was built in 1593 for the Earls of Derby. They lived here for many years. It then fell into disrepair and was known for many years as Mock Beggar Hall. In fact, the shoreline just down the road is still known to this day as Mock Beggar. And of course, there are ghosts here. There are more than one sighting of a ghost in here, but the most famous one is the haunted bedroom where a father and son who were staying, the, the father murdered the son, and then, would you believe, committed suicide in the same bedroom. Nobody knows why, perhaps it was a domestic, but even to this day, this building is still haunted by that tragic couple, father and son, that died here at Liso Castle. And I'm now inside the castle. With me, Peter, you're the, you're the owner of this castle. Yes, I am, yes. And you've got ghosts in here, I presume? I think we have, yes. There have been reports of really? ghosts in the castle, yes. Can you... Particularly this room here. Right. Come on through. Yes, please. Um, Just well, look at that ceiling. Yes, it's beautiful, isn't it? Uh, the, this ceiling dates back to the, the 1800s. Wow. It was actually brought up from the Palace of Westminster in London. Really? Back in, from, you know, from the 1800s. Yeah. And also the, the tapestries and the wood, wood panelling all come from uh, the Palace of Westminster. Oh, I never realised. Isn't it in, fantastic? Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. So there's great history of, in this particular room. Yeah. But uh, uh, I was sitting uh, 
uh, alongside uh, a colleague of mine uh, not many weeks ago actually and she saw something out of the corner of her eye and it was certainly not something going past the, the window and, uh, and... It was in the room? It was definitely in the room and she just said, I've just seen a ghost. Apparently she does see right. ghosts. Some people do, some people don't. I don't. No. Yeah, yeah. Um, but she said, oh, I've just seen a ghost, but it's absolutely fine. You know, there's no, um, so it wasn't sort of a bad spirit. Oh, no. Something. And um, she reported this little ghost not many weeks ago to, to me here in, in this very room. While you were sitting with her? Yeah, just... Um, Corner of, the eye, corner of the that's eye, that's what it so shadow. often is, yeah. 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 And, and people just, tend to uh, say, oh, a bit of imagination, yeah. something, as you say, walking past the window, yeah. but no, I can assure you, it's, uh, you know, Could they're, well they're there. Yeah. We're just sitting here, just having a cup of tea, as you know, we've just been enjoying yeah. you know, a few minutes ago. Amazing. So, yeah. What it's about a great history here, you oh, see. Oh, incredible place. What about haunted bedrooms or anything upstairs? Or Yes, we do. We have, uh, again, we've had one or two reports of uh, sort of... Uh, sightings of, of ghosts really? but, uh, and we've got a beautiful bedroom i should show you oh, yeah, the, uh, yeah. the earl of derby suite yeah. can, can we, very nice can we go upstairs and have a look yeah come thanks yeah right what a, an incredible staircase yes it's a fantastic staircase we've got lots of dates on the on the, on the staircase really? which, which um, depict sort of battle dates particular yeah. battle dates in the uh, of the UK, so really? This called the, the, the Battle Staircase. And before we go to the suite, I should yes. tell you about this mirror here. That's big. This is big, yeah, it is big. A big mirror. But we had a film company not very long ago, Richard, that mm -hmm. uh, uh, took, took a shot of this mirror. And when they replayed it on their recording equipment, there was something that happened to the, you know, the shape of the mirror. There was something that sort of uh, gave it a, a quiver or a sort of... A, a distortion? A distortion. Or yeah. They didn't actually see sort of a figure in it. Well, obviously, they probably saw the cameraman in it. <laughs> but No, the, he, he said when he did the filming, he didn't actually see anything at all. And they actually did it twice. And both times, there, were, there was a distortion. So really? uh, that, was, that was quite a, a spooky... Uh, oh, absolutely. Thing. And you can see that we've actually got three hinges here on the side. So, um, so this is a... Actually it's open. Yeah, and behind there, again, there's one of the little cubby holes that we often have in, in the castle itself. So An another hidey hole? Another little hidey hole behind Or priest too. hole, or because obviously 1593, yeah. when this was built, it's the right period for, for Catholic um, people hiding Catholics, yeah. Protestant soldiers banging on the door, so it could well be uh, could well have something like that. Yeah. And similar perhaps upstairs. Up in the swing. Okay, yeah, let's on. go and have a look. Yeah. So, entering room 22. Yes, this is yeah. uh, the Earl of Derby suite. Oh, that's rather appropriate. It is really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. just a bit. And uh, this room is uh, particularly good, and this has got uh, a bit of a history to it as well, actually. Right. Uh, when we refurbished this room, which wasn't very long ago, um, we refurbished the bathroom yep. to, uh, you know... This is good. Yes, yeah. very nice. But this room, this bathroom, was just formed in this direction, that this was not part of the bathroom at all. This wasn't? No, this, this was completely um, partitioned off and tiled as if it was not there at all. Right. And when we chipped away the tiles, the, uh, the builders actually almost fell into this little cubby hole here. Secret room? Secret room. Uh, and it's formed a, a, you know, a nice bath. Oh Whereas yeah. There was a, a, quite a large area that was obviously partitioned up, had a lovely stone backed. Really? So it, it was done properly, it was hidden oh, yeah. for something, yeah. there was nothing in it? Nothing in it at all. No skeletons, no, 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 no weapons, nothing, that's no, a shame. No, no, but uh, obviously quite, a, quite an area that uh, was, oh, yeah. was hidden, hidden yeah. from view. Yeah, but of course it, it, is a, it is a building of, of sort of hidey holes and passages. Yeah, yeah, we've got the um, spiral staircases. Yeah, the, the mirror of course and, and various mirror. things yeah. like that. Yeah. So for all we know something could have been hidden in here and yeah. who knows, crumbled to dust. Possibly, quite yeah. possibly. Yeah. But of course the, the actual ghost story is of a man and his son who apparently were staying here. The, the, the old man for some strange reason killed his son, yeah. murdered him. I have heard the story, yeah. And then shot himself. Yeah. Um, and their ghosts apparently 
a still scene. In fact, we're talking to the, to the lady behind the reception. She yeah. said, oh yes, she said, I, I, know, I know the story because yeah. one or two people have actually reported seeing, seeing this man wandering around. But of course, no one's sure which room it is, are they? That's right, I'm not quite sure. Yeah. No. So we don't get people who have stayed here who have come down sort of white in the morning. No, move me to another room, no, please. Because absolutely. It, but but, but uh, could well be. it could well be this room. Could but, well be, but yeah. Basically, if you, if you want a, a haunted hotel, a haunted bedroom, yeah. In Merseyside, then Earl of Derby, Earl of Derby room yeah. or suite. Earl of Derby suite in uh, at Lisa Castle. Yeah. That's wonderful. Thanks yeah. very much indeed. No at all. Thank you. Great. Thanks. We've been swanning around for the best part of an hour, looking for the site of the old Palace Hotel at Birkdale, which was supposed to be haunted. We were about to give up, and we drove down here, and we saw a road called Palace Road. I stopped and asked a car park attendant and he sent me down here. All I knew was that there was a story of the lift that operated itself. Years ago when it was a hotel, the staff checked it every night because they couldn't stop it. And in the 1960s, when it was being demolished, the workmen were having the same problems. But that was it, until I arrived here. And I saw a poem on the wall of the pub called The Fisherman's Rest. On such a night in the distant past, the surf raged high on the beach. The Mexico bark on a bank was fast. No port that night would she reach. Three lifeboats to her aid were sent by fishermen manned with good intent. One boat returned, her crew to save. The others would drown in that terrible gale. To this place they brought them here into rest. No man can do more than to give of his best. A nation mourned and mourning new pride, the pride of a nation. In vain they not died. Apparently this is all that's left of the old Palace Hotel. This was the bar, which is still preserved. It was to this place that the 27 bodies were brought that were found after that disaster on that terrible night of December the 9th, 1886. And they still haunt this place. To the back here, now there are houses on the site where the original Palace Hotel was built. And apparently, people still have problems. Poltergeist activity in the buildings. And apparently, the architect who built the palace designed it the wrong way round. And they built it, apparently, back to front. And even he committed suicide. But whether it was here, I don't know. But let's go inside and see if there are any more ghost stories. But come and join me. And we're now actually inside the pub, uh, the Fisherman's Rest. And with me, Lee, you're the, the manager. Yes, indeed. And it's just been refurbished by the looks yeah, of it. Yeah, in November. Yeah, but this was originally the vaults of the old yeah, palace. Yeah, the public part of the Palace Hotel, and then when the hotel was knocked down, this, this was the only part of the building that's remained, and it was become, became the Fisherman's Rest when the hotel was knocked down. Right, and what happened in here? What? Well, basically, the story behind the pub is that in 1886, there was a lifeboat disaster off, off sea. There was a ship called the Mexico which went down. The lifeboat crews from Lytham and from Southport were sent out yeah. to, retrieve the, to retrieve the ship. And basically, the bodies that were retrieved and brought back were laid to rest here in the pub. Hence, it's called the Fisherman's Rest. Oh, I see. And so, I mean, there were actually 27 bodies, apparently, that the, some of the killed from the Mexico, or the drowned yeah, from the Mexico. Yeah, it was actually the, it was a mixture of lifeboatmen and yeah. crew of the ships. And, and the, the lifeboat, I think, was called the Eliza Fernley. It was, yes. Uh, they should have had 14 crew, but they'd made it up to 16 because they knew it was such a serious storm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And apparently only two survived. Two survived. There's a couple of people on the pictures on the wall who are the, who are the people who were They're saved. the actual survivors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Crikey. And uh, what about, I mean obviously, because it's a haunted mm -hmm. pub isn't it, which is why we're here. Yeah. Um, what, what, has anything happened to you here or? Not to me particularly, but old stories from the past of ex-landlords and people who've worked here have heard rumblings in the cellars and late at night chains. Really? Loads of chains and things going on. Yeah, because I mean apparently when it was a hotel, or sorry, when they demolished the hotel in 1969, mm -hmm. there was a huge lift, mm -hmm. a four-ton lift that the workmen couldn't, they couldn't stop it 
going up and down. Mm -hmm. um, there was no electricity in the place. Mm -hmm. They cut all the wires to the lift and it still continued to go up and down. Well, it wouldn't go sideways, would it? <laughs> Went up and down. And eventually they started pounding it with 28 pound lump hammers to try and, I suppose, pound it. To, and they did, it literally started to slide down and it crashed into what was apparently the cellars. Right. And um, embedded itself in there. And um, that's, that's really the story I'd heard about, which brought me here All right. today. But I didn't realise that there was such a wealth, yeah, a bit of history behind such it. a story behind mm -hmm. it. That actually 27 bodies were stored here, and, and that we've got a um, a disaster. Mm -hmm, indeed. No wonder the place is as haunted as it is. Absolutely. That's fantastic. Thank you, Thank you very much indeed. Cheers. Cheers. I'm in the centre of Liverpool. They tell me that it's the ghost capital of the northwest, and we're here looking for ghosts. And we've just literally walked past BBC Radio Merseyside. I just popped in, told them what we're doing, and they said, well, why don't you come in? Tom Slemons here. He is the leading authority on ghosts in this area. And they're going to fix up for us to go on, on air. So let's see what we can find. I've got Steve Lilly with me, who runs a firm called Past in Pictures. It's a video firm based in Derby, and Richard Felix is from the Derby Heritage Centre, and they're doing a series of videos uh, on ghost towns, on, on ghosts in towns right across uh, the country. Richard is with us now. Welcome, Richard. Hi. Hello. You, you're the ghost hunter, you call yourself, don't you? Indeed. Yeah, I'm the and, bloke. Yep. And dressed appropriately, in all fairness. <laughs> well, of course. You look more like a ghost hunter than you do. So <laughs> <laughs> now, now, Tom, Richard is here with the boast that they're going to officially declare Derby the ghost capital of England, as Richard reckons there are more ghosts in Derby than anywhere else in Great Britain. Oh, I think there's more in Liverpool myself. Well, you would, wouldn't you? Yeah, I do, I really do. This, this is like a ghostly uh, capital. Yeah. There's more ghosts per square yard here than anywhere. Uh, than probably London. But Richard has been to how many cities so yeah, far? Uh, well, up to the, up, well, we've done, since Christmas, 11 counties uh, filmed researched and, and went, but um, to be honest with you, the thing is, something about Derby, I don't know, it's, I call it the dead centre of England, you see, um, and um, this is, five years ago I did a book, um, guess what, Ghosts of Derby, um, co-wrote it uh, with a rather famous medium, and York, who boasted Ghost Capital of England, boasts 140 rumoured sightings of ghosts within the city of York. When we did the book, and we looked out, and I got this little booklet that stated how many ghosts York had got. I said to this, my co-author, Wayne, I said, how many, how many recorded sightings have we got? Mm. And he came back and he said, well, we've got in excess of 150 in the centre of Derby. I'm not talking rumoured, I'm talking Mrs. So-and-so from... What constitutes a recorded sighting really? We're talking of the, knowing of the person. We've either got name, addresses, a, re a recording of, you know, on cassette or, or video or what have you, of that person. In other words, that person... Describing saw, the described the ghost, yeah. Not a rumour. And and not a cutting from a paper. No, no, no. No, no. no. The book. These are actually recorded, recorded sightings by people. And that is pushing it, I'll tell you. And, and up to now, up to now, but uh, this is my second day here, um, I've not come up with anything like 150 ghosts. I think it's Derby's location. I presume then, when you come to Liverpool, you, you look for someone to give you an insight into where the ghost can be found. Oh yes, yes indeed. So what do you do, go to the tourist board? Well, we, we, we obviously start with the internet. Obviously we look, look at the Good Ghost Guide and various other books and references that we've got. But the best way, of course, is just having a, um, what's the word, a thread. You pull in that thread and usually at the end of it there's a pot of gold. And we, this has happened already today. Um, you just go, you arrive, you've got a little story knock on the door or the door happens to be open, excuse me, we're do have you got to, oh, have we got to go, and away they go. And the store is elaborated on to such an extent that you end up with a, a belting story. And that's, I tell you, that's happened to us today in a big oh, way. Where did that happen, Richard? That was um, some, some will probably know Birkendale, it. Birkdale, oh, the, Birkdale, the Fisherman's Rest. That's right, that was by the size of um, the Birkdale Hotel, that was yeah. the most haunted spot. That's right. I've ever investigated. Uh, 1969, I remember it was being demolished, and there was quite a few ghostly goings on there, including a very violent poltergeist. That's right. Who, uh, I think they could the lift. The lift. Yeah. And at one, they were written with sledgehammers, couldn't move this thing. There wasn't an amp of electricity, 
going that's through, it yeah and then it plummeted right through the uh, basement yeah. he brought an alsatian dog on the premises and the dog was acting very strange uh, to, and i've heard that many stories about it but i'm not too certain what was behind that, that ah thing. well i do um, it was a suicide. no incredible story um no. It, it can, there is a suicide because the yeah. designer of the hotel built it the wrong way around or designed it the wrong way around and actually committed suicide because of the the stick that he was getting from people because the whole place was built and then someone said hang on a minute it's the wrong way around but no the, the incredible story is the disaster of uh, the 9th of December 1886 when 27 fishermen perished on the coast and all their bodies were brought back there to the to that hotel where, and where, laid there. Where would you point Richard at while he's... It's just yes. the day you're here, Richard. Yeah, we're, we're here today as well, so we're looking for other well, stories. How are you, Richard? I was looking for a ghostly hot spot, so definitely check out uh, Rodney Street, the, the Presbyterian Church. It's just a shell, it's a ruin. Oh, really? On the corner of Rodney Street and Maryland Street. And you'll find the pyramidal tomb there. Yeah. It's about 30 feet high. And it accommodates the uh, body of a, a man named William James Mackenzie, who was an inveterate gambler. And he had no luck in gambling, so he said, when I die, I want you to um, entomb me sitting up at a card table with a winning poker hand in his full attire. And is he? He's still there in, inside that tomb. We're going to get plans to x-ray it. I should uh, think and so. And his ghost, his restless ghost, has been seen walking around Maryland Street, Rodney Street. Mm. As Billy once said, it's a question of who hasn't seen yeah. the ghost. Really? It's been seen by policemen and firemen and taxi drivers and Gosh. people whose credibility... Yeah, like, second to none, you know yeah. I mean? yeah. Oh, yes, that's a good one. Is it far from here? No, it's not that too far from it. Oh, well, we... Yeah. What's your most frightening experience? Oh, my experience? personal yeah. most frightening experience was... was um, I've got the old county jail in, in Derby, which was where the last hanging, drawing and quartering in England took place. And I saw a ghost in there. I actually saw it myself, 20 past three in the afternoon. I was alone in there, and it went down the corridor. It frightened me to death. It was a grey hazy... It wasn't a person, but it was the, the shape and size. And I'll tell you something, it... It alters your your um, whole idea of what when people talk to you. Is that usually to. seen as a Tom as a grey haze? Yeah, the things I've seen have been sort of manifested themselves as hazy objects. Like really? And uh, also where uh, drops in temperature. Yeah. Now there was none of that with me, funnily enough. Yeah. Which I found strange. Do you think you're psychic or? No, I really don't. But it's the f it's, it's not the first time I heard a ghost in Nottingham, a place called Bestwood Lodge, and that was I believe a recording, in the fabric of the building. I. I I think it was his tragic death, premature death, that caused him to still be there. And I was, I was on Channel Five, and I think he came through on on Channel Five mm -hmm. that evening, twenty twenty five years ago. Um, that wasn't frightening, because it was so real. It was, it was just a, like listening to a cassette player. But there was okay, no. Okay, well, there. maybe we suggest Rich that you get a copy of Tom's six or seven books, which you're all about. I'm sure that's a very good idea. Rule and they'll point you in the right direction. And if we're not ghost capital of the uh, country, I'll be made up. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can wants see. to be ghost capital of the country? Oh, it, 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 it adds, you know, the visit you're visitors. The board. Well, that's what it's all about. <laughs> <laughs> and you must go and visit our Heritage Centre while you're there as well. We Rich. must do that. Super. Thanks for popping in. It's a pleasure. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Well, that was a bit worthwhile. Um, We've just done um, a broadcast in there uh, with Tom, but some of the stories that he's told me, um, the addresses, the locations that he's now given me has is given us enough to, well, probably fill two videos. So uh, I'm going off to um, look for them, and record them. It's probably the most outrageous thing I've done on this tour up to now. I'm looking for the Rodney Street Spectre. It's in this churchyard and it's completely boarded up and gated. And the only way was over this wall, so here we go. We may be able to film the police arresting me as well. I'm inside. I'm going to be very quick before the police come. This incredible tomb here never seen anything like it it's one of the most haunted places in Liverpool this is the tomb of William Alistair Mackenzie he was a famous character in Liverpool he was a railway promoter and he was a gambler he died as people do and in his will he said that he wanted to be buried dressed 
sitting at a card table with his winning hand on the table. That's exactly what happened. And the sitting up body of Mr. Mackenzie is actually inside that tomb. There are many, many ghost stories to do with it. In fact, there are more people that haven't seen him that have seen him. He's seen wearing a top hat and a cloak. People liken him to a vampire. Policemen have seen him, milkmen have seen him. People going to and from their jobs along Rodney Street have seen him. He even propositioned a prostitute. He hadn't got his top hat on and he was talking to her, asking how much she would charge. He then wrapped his cloak around him, put his top hat on and she fled to the local police station, told them that she'd been propositioned by this vampire and the policeman said to her, it wasn't in Rodney Street, was it? And just now, as I was trying to break in over the wall, um, a hot dog seller around the other side said, excuse me, mate, can you leave that board where it is? I said, well, can I just borrow it to break into the churchyard? Oh, he said, if you see a man in a top hat and a cloak, remember me to him, because he says, I've seen him on frequent occasions. I'm not waiting to see him. It's daylight now, but I'm going to break out of this churchyard and go home. This is the very imposing and very unusual graveyard of Liverpool Cathedral. This was once a quarry and they tell me that the stone for the cathedral came from this quarry which of course left a very large hole. What better than to use it as a graveyard. After my trip to uh, BBC Radio Merseyside, they told me there were many, many ghosts here. So many that I could spend the afternoon here talking about it. There are grey ladies, white ladies, and vampires. But the most important ghost here is the limping spectre of William Huskisson. This is his mausoleum or memorial. He was buried here in September 1830 and he has the distinction of being the very first person in the world to be run over by a train and it wasn't just any old train. He was run over by Stevenson's rocket and they say that to this day his limping spectre still wanders this graveyard at dead of night. Behind me here, the famous Mersey Tunnel, the now famous haunted Mersey Tunnel. Between November 2000 and January 2001, the officers of BBC Radio Merseyside was inundated with phone calls from people that had seen a phantom hitchhiker standing in the middle of the tunnel trying to hitch a lift. One chap saw her in the morning and slowed up for her but didn't stop. And when he came home, 11 hours later through the tunnel, he saw her again still standing in the same position. There is no possible way that that young girl could have been standing there for 11 hours. The most chilling experience was from a lad called Liam riding his motorbike through the tunnel. He saw the girl, smallish girl, with light coloured long hair, thumbing a lift. He stopped to give her a lift. He took his spare helmet from the side of his bike and passed it to her. She took it off him, put it on her head climbed onto the back of the motorcycle. He sped off through the tunnel. When he got through the tunnel to the other side, she was no longer there. And the helmet was hung back at the side of the seat. She just completely vanished from the back of his motorbike. And people still report seeing her to this very day. So if you're driving through the Mersey Tunnel late at night, 
keep an eye open for the phantom hitchhiker. Whether you want to stop or not, that's up to you. Hello, my name's Richard Felix, and I'm here at my base at the Old County Jail in the centre of Derby. This place over the last 150 years has been a place of terror, torment, and of course death. And that's one of the reasons why this place is as haunted as it is. I've chosen Derby as the catalyst for the national ghost tour of Great Britain. Over the last 10 years, I have taken in excess of 95,000 people on a ghost tour somewhere around the Midlands. And of course, have spoken to many of those people on the tours and of course have realised just how fascinated people are by ghosts. This is the reason that we have chosen to do this tour. The video that you've just watched is a part of that series, but I want your help. If you have a ghost story, then please either email me or write to me at the address that you'll see at the end of this video. Of course, you must remember that after speaking to so many people, I think I have an ability to be able to see through some of the stories, to be able to differentiate between a story that is true or a story that's made up. And of course, you must remember that eight out of ten ghost stories can be explained but it's the other two that you've got to worry about. I hope you've enjoyed the video. Do sleep well and don't have nightmares.